three organizations that you see here on your screen, Garden State Watercolor Society, Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, and DNR Greenway Land Trust. Um, and so in the beginning, we're going to have Leah talk about uh, everything you ever want to know about bats. And, um, and then I will come back and talk a little bit about art. And we'll introduce you to some of our artists and, and talk about what we have going on at the Johnson Education Center. So uh, Leah is a uh, wildlife biologist with Conserve uh, Wildlife Foundation. And uh, I would like you to take it from here. All right, well, hi everyone. My name's Leah. I, like she mentioned, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey. Um, to give a little background about myself, I started working with bats in 2018 as an intern with one of my professors at Rutgers University. And then in 2019, Conserve Wildlife um, hired me as an intern. And then the following year, I got hired on as part of their staff. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the bats of New Jersey. So to start off, what are bats? Bats are mammals like you and I, dogs, whales, cats, wolves, but bats are not rodents, contrary to popular belief. They're in their own order called the Chiroptera, which means hand wing, and their wings are just modified hands. They have all the same structures as you and I, just different proportions. In this picture, you can kind of see, you can see all their long fingers, um, their th thumbs up at the top. Um, and there's over 1,300 species of bats found throughout the world. There's 47 species found here in the US. And in New Jersey, we have nine species of bats. Bats are an incredibly diverse group of mammals. Um, they, they make up one fourth of all mammalian species and they all look pretty different from each other and serve different purposes. Some have big ears. Some have small ears, some have big eyes, some have tiny eyes, some are fuzzy, and some are naked. Some are cute, and some are pretty darn ugly. Um, bats come in all different shapes and sizes. There's the smallest bat in the world and the smallest mammal in the world called the bumblebee bat. This bat weighs about this way bat, bat weighs less than a penny and its wingspan is about three inches and its body is about, I believe, 1.2 1 inches long. And then we also have our big bats, they're called the flying foxes. These are found also in Asia and Thailand and their wingspan can get up to the same size about a, as a bald eagle. So they're really, really big. But our bats in New Jersey are pretty small. Our bats are all insectivorous, which means that they only eat insects. And they, our bats also only come out at nighttime. So to be able to navigate the world around them at night, they use a, a technique called echolocation where they emit out a call and it bounces off objects around them. And they're able to pinpoint exactly where their food is and navigate the forest in complete darkness. And here's a bat, hopefully you guys can hear. So bats live a really long time for an animal their size. Um, you think like a rodent, they're the same size as a rodent that they would live, you know, a couple years. Um, but we, they're a little, little brown bat, which is a bat we have in New Jersey, lives a really long time. They captured, put a band on it, and then recaptured that same bat 28 years later. So they live a really, really long time. And they also reproduce really slowly for an animal their size. Many of our bats here in New Jersey only have one baby a year. Um, and some of our migratory species can have upwards of three babies at a time, or usually twins. And when they're born, the bats are roughly um, one third of the mom's size. So they grow pretty quickly. Um, here's an eastern red bat, one of our migratory species, and it is pregnant probably with twins. You can see her big belly. So the bats of New Jersey. So we have th nine species of bats total in New Jersey. Uh, three are our part-time residents, and that is our silvered hair bat, our hoary bat, and our eastern red bat. And then we have our full-time residents, the northern long-eared bat, which is an endangered bat here in New Jersey, 
the Indiana bat, which is another endangered bat, the tricolored bat, which will probably be uplisted soon, the eastern small-footed bat, the little brown bat, and the big brown bat. So what does a bat do throughout the year in New Jersey? So around late summer and the fall, they'll start moving towards their uh, winter grounds, their hibernaculum. That's our full-time residence here, the cave-dwelling bats. And in the fall, they'll form a mating swarm outside. And what's really cool about bats is the female bat will actually mate with males and then hold the sperm inside of her and then impregnate herself the next spring. Um, also, when they go in for the winter, they uh, go into a state of torpor, which is where their body temperature drops to the ambient air temperature in the cave. Their heart beats only a couple times per minute. They're only breathing um, a couple times per minute. Um, and that's how they basically stay all winter long. And here's a bat inside of a cave and you can see the condensation and ice crystals on its fur because its body temperature is so low. And then the spring and summer and the spring, they'll start waking up from hibernation. Um, and the females and males will separate. The females will form maternity colonies of upwards of 50 plus bats where they'll raise their young together. And the males will either go solo or they'll form small bachelor colonies of about five bats. And they'll roost in different uh, areas throughout, the, throughout New Jersey. Um, the big brown bat and little brown bat are known to roost in man-made structures like your barns, your attics, bat houses, attics and eaves. Um, the eastern red bat and hoary bats like to roost in foliage. A lot of other bats too will roost, you know, under bark. Um, under bridges and dead trees, you can find them there. And here's a bunch of little, I mean, big brown bats inside of someone's attic. So the bats at Hillside. So since we're talking about migration, um, I'm gonna be focusing on mainly the three part-time residents, our hoary bat, our silver-haired bat, and our eastern red bat. Um, last summer, I put up acoustic detectors um, around hillside property uh, to find out what species of bats were there. So I use an acoustic detector and what you can see on the right hand side. Um, their acoustic detectors are a passive way to survey for bats. The acoustic detectors record bats as they fly overhead um, as they use their echolocation. Um, our detectors picked up all three of our migratory bat species at hillside. Um, which is really cool. So uh, these are our three migratory species just again. Um, so during the summer, they'll be here at Hillside foraging, mate, uh, raising their young and uh, just hanging out. And then in the winter, like fall time, they will travel south uh, to spend the winter months in warmer climates and then come back up in the springtime. And our migratory bats face a little bit different challenges than our resident bat species. Um, they have to worry about wind turbines and habitat loss. Um, the wind turbines are a big problem, mostly out in the middle of the country and out west. Uh, a lot of bats die from them every year, but fortunately working with power companies um, and different organizations were able to reduce the speeds of the wind turbines and then also um, reduce the habitat loss. So thank you. That's pretty much it. That was amazing. Um, we have time for questions for Leah, if anyone has them. You can just put them in the chat and we will take a look at them. I don't know if we have any questions. Yes. This is Linda. Linda, you back? I'm back and I, I heard the whole presentation, which was amazing. Thank you, Leah. No, no and um, I know Leah has been to Hillside Farm more than 20 times which is, you know, really shows that she's out there doing a, a very thorough and comprehensive inventory. Um, and when you were showing your um, slides, there was a picture, um, which is not at Hillside, but there was a picture of a, a bat cave with a gate on the front. Can you tell us where that is and speak about that at all? Yeah, let me go back to the slide. So 
So this is actually a hibernaculum up in Rockaway Township in Morris County called, um, what am I blanking, Hibernia Mine. Um, and you, no one can really get inside of it. You need a special key and lock, but it's a really cool mine. I've never been in it personally, but I heard there's a lot of cool bat species there. Uh, some Indiana bats, some Northern Longyears, Little Browns. Um, but it's a really cool place. You can walk right up to the the entrance point. Um, and I heard in the fall, in the fall, you can see a lot of the bats like swarming around at night and also in the spring, a lot of them emerging from the cave as well. Thanks, Leah. I just wanted to share that um, I wondered where that was because many years ago I worked in, in Upper Bucks County in Pennsylvania on a very similar project um, where we put a gate on a bat, an old mine, an old iron ore mine, just like this. And uh, it was because it was being vandalized and uh, people were going in in the winter and disturbing the bats, waking them up, and then they would lose that energy that they were yeah. building and it would kind of destroy their whole life cycle. And so Bat Conservation International supplied us with the, um, the architectural drawings, if you will, for the gate. And what was probably one of my most memorable experiences was going up at night with the, the wildlife biologists with infrared glasses on because oh, that's really cool. you could not see them really as much in the dark, but with those infrared glasses on, it was like there were thousands of bats flying in and out of that mine. It was that's fascinating. Good. And I know in the <laughs> um, Garden State watercolor exhibit, there's some wonderful uh, drawings of bats, some endangered bats. So I hope people will come and see those at the Johnson Education Center, um, right in the lobby in the gone, going, going, gone exhibit. So thank you, Leah. No problem. Okay, I have a couple things, a couple comments and questions possibly. Um, Karen Repko was asking, besides habitat loss and wind turbines, um, are there other major risks for bats? Oh yeah, um, not our migratory species, but our cave dwelling bats, uh, the biggest challenge they face is white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease that affects uh, the hibernating bats. And what it basically does is it causes them to wake up more frequently when they're hibernating. And each time that they wake up, they're using more energy that they need stored throughout the winter. Um, and they basically starve to death or dehyde, get so dehydrated that they die. Um, it hit in 2009 in a cave, I believe, in New York, uh, and it's kind of spread westward. Um, it's popping up all over, even in California now. Um, we believe that our bats in New Jersey aren't really dying from it anymore. Um, they've kind of passed along their genetic makeup, um, and we're noticing that bats are gaining a little bit more weight before they go into hibernation or they're just able to survive now which is it's good but the hard thing with bats is like I mentioned um, they only have one baby a year so a population increase is going to take quite some time. Hmm. Um, another question is I live in a one-story house where can I position a bat house? Um, bat houses have to be placed about 12 feet or higher. So if your house is taller than 12 feet, you could place it, you know, on a south facing um, side of your house or post it on a pole or a post uh, in the ground. Um, we don't recommend putting them on trees because bats need to be really warm inside their bat house and the trees also, they provide too much shade and also it's an easier access point for other predators to get inside and disturb them. Okay. Uh, so far, the other questions had to do had to do with the white nose syndrome, um, and you touched upon that. Uh, where are the migrating bats migrating from, and where are they going to? Um, so that's a big question. We don't exactly know. There was a um, Virginia Tech grad student actually doing research on this the past couple years. Um, we have these modus towers all throughout um, the state. Not that many, but a decent amount of them. Um, and we put uh, these nano tags on the red bats to see where they were going. Our red bats seem to be from even North Jersey traveling down over the Delaware Bay um, and going south. We don't have enough modus towers to see where they're going after that. Um, but we believe it's 
you know, they can travel pretty far. It's pretty incredible with their size. I mean, the birds do the same thing, um, but we're not exactly sure. We just know it's warmer climate. So yeah, <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to figure that out. So somebody's grandson wants to know what are the major predators of bats? Uh, probably cats, um, outdoor cats, I would say. Um, I know owls sometimes will uh, hunt them, but that's why they come out at night is to avoid, you know, other aerial predators. Because if they came out during the day, a lot of birds would snatch them up. But I would say cats. Hmm. Wow, that's interesting. Um, that's it right now. We'll see if anybody else has any more, but those were the questions. Excellent. We should have some time at the end as well, because uh, we're making pretty good time. Okay. How about the next slide, Leah? Thank you. Art like science is born of observation and investigation of nature. Uh, so this is Tess Fields. I'm back again, and I want to thank Linda and DNR for having us uh, we love collaborating with DNR. Uh, these themed exhibits uh, are exciting and really cause inspiration and encourage people to learn more about the environment. So that's one of their goals and that's one of our goals. So we're, we're happy to be able to do it together. And we've also enjoyed working with Conserve Wildlife Foundation Director Liz Silvernail and today's wildlife biologist Leah Wells, who has also helped us out with our, um, our slides. So uh, art, uh, the art part of the art and science mashup is highlights of art from the, uh, Garden State Watercolors 53rd Annual Juried Exhibition. Uh, this exhibition has a theme, it's migration, uh, movement for survival. And so today we're going to hear from three award-winning artists, Peter Zdenik, Sandy Mazinas, and Gloria Wernick, um, who will talk about different approaches and techniques they use to create their paintings about migration. First, we're going to hear from Peter who painted Wildebeest Migration. This painting won one of our New Jersey Audubon Awards. Uh, Peter created, why don't you go to the next slide, uh, a unique and dynamic painting that clearly conveys the risk and danger often associated with migration. And I have to say that myself and my granddaughter attended the first workshop, a uh, poetry workshop that was held in June. Uh, and this, I wrote a poem about this painting, never saw it coming, but I did. And uh, I found it incredibly dynamic and enjoyed doing it. So we're gonna hear from Peter. Okay, thank you, Tess. My wife and I migrated ourselves to Pennsylvania from New Jersey about nine years ago in 2014. And uh, lucky for me, my own migration didn't interrupt my membership in the Garden State Watercolor Society. I started painting about 20 years ago as a hobby, and my first painting was accepted into the juried show of the Garden State Watercolor Society back in 2009. So this year, I was very honored to receive an award for this, this painting. It does show a herd of wildebeest crossing a river during their annual migration in Africa. Uh, for the artists who may be listening, I just used the limited palette, which I don't often do, but uh, I just used three colors to make the painting, ultramarine blue, raw sienna, and burnt sienna. What I wanted to do with the painting is convey a sense of movement and excitement for the viewer. So I, I used some splatter and lost and found edges to suggest that movement. So when they do this migration, there's danger from predators, from crocodiles, lions, and other predators on the land. And when they jump into the water as they're doing now, uh, the danger is, is from crocodiles who are wait to ambush them. But 
yet they still have the courage to plunge ahead. And, and I admired that very much. There's also a herd mentality. The young and the weak are on the inside for protection from the rest of the herd. And you can see that a bit in the lower left-hand corner. There's also some sense of trust and safety in the herd. Uh, as far as being influenced by other artists, I like the softness of a cloud of dust that we often see in paintings of wild horses running in a cloud of dust. And I use some wet and wet and some lost edges to achieve that effect. When people view the painting, I would like them to see a sense of motion in the herd. That, that was the challenge for me to come up with some sense of the motion that's going on. Uh, and also the curry, courage and bravery of those animals. They just plunge ahead and it takes courage to do what they do. I can confess that there are times when I need to just plunge ahead myself. Migration for survival is a very broad subject, and I wanted to do something a bit different than the things that we're all familiar with, such as birds and butterflies. When I visited the exhibit myself and I took the time to read what each person wrote about their paintings, I really enjoyed it and found it very relaxing and enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, I agree uh, that it's a kind of an inspiring exhibit, and um, there's surprises all throughout how how uh, people did their paintings to meet the theme. So we're very happy with that. And art, of course, always looks always looks better and different when you see it uh, in in real life. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we're going to hear from Sandy Mazinas, uh, who created her painting La Esperanza. Uh, she has a very personal connection with the theme of this painting. She's a, an accomplished painter who is a signature member of the American Watercolor Society. And for those of you that aren't familiar with AWS, this organization has been around since 1866 and has artists members from around the globe. So it's a big deal to have one of our lovely portraits accepted into this year's juried exhibition. So Sandy's gonna tell us now about how she came to create her painting, La Esperanza. Thank you, Tess. Um, although I'm a figure and portrait painter, a series of events caused me to choose this image as an inspiration for my migration. My husband and I winter in the Florida Keys and our condo was on the beach in Marathon. About the time Tess announced migration as the theme for this year's open juried expedi expedition, a Cuban migrant boat landed on our beach. There has been an increase of Cuban landings this year due to the recent economic decline in Cuba. Since January 2023, 3,000 Cuban boats have been apprehended at sea. The journey is a treacherous one through the Florida Straits, 90 miles from Cuba to Key West. We awoke in the early morning to this stunning image. The Cubans often paint names on their boats. As you can see, this boat is emblazoned in large letters, La Esperanza, which means hope in Spanish. I thought this was so emblematic of the courage and the bravery in undertaking such a risky journey, and I was quite moved by the experience. The boat was only 25 feet long, and it held 27 men, women, and children. It was such a spectacular sight. It was almost begging to be painted. I couldn't resist. I painted the sky Windsor, cerulean, and cobalt blue, and Prussian blue close to the brilliant white clouds and permanent rose next to the horizon. The sea, which was calm at dawn, ultramarine blue and turquoise, 
and the sandy shore, conacritum gold and violet. I would have liked to have painted the Cubans, but they had long vanished into the seagrass and palm trees. For many years, the United Nations had a wet foot, dry foot policy. If Cubans landed on dry land, they were allowed to stay, but that policy was abolished and currently they are repatriated. Although in some cases, if there's a family member that can sponsor them, they may be granted asylum. As Tess mentioned, I'm a signature member of the American Watercolor Society, also signature Garden State, New Jersey Watercolor, Florida Watercolor, and Florida Keys Watercolor Societies. I exhibit at the studios of Key West, the Florida Council of the Arts, and the Key West Art and Historical Society. I would like to thank the Garden State Board for their help in preparing this presentation. I really like the themed exhibits. I think they're a challenge uh, to creativity. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's an inspiration and exciting for some people and for other people, they're, they're, they shy away from themed exhibits, but there you have it. We don't always have themed ex, uh, exhibits, uh, like next year we will not, but then hopefully the next time we're back at DNR, we will. Um, and so that is that. So la our last uh, artist is Gloria Wernick. She won our second place award for her painting, Shifting Sands. Um, she, her work is instantly recognizable and often remind viewers of stained glass. It's unique and never fails to draw viewers into her paintings. So we're gonna hear from Gloria now. Thank you, Tess. I appreciate uh, your introduction. Um, just a little about myself. I studied painting at the Art Students League in Manhattan and with artists uh, uh, with Jacob Landau from Pratt and have taken numerous watercolor workshops with Barbara Neckes, Maxi Masterfield, and Dominique Di Stefano. And all these folks had, and the institution I was at have influenced my work, I have to say. I started out in oils, but then shifted into watercolor eventually. And uh, I've never regretted that because it's, it's definitely my favorite medium. Um, though I always work from nature, I, I use abstract colors, shapes, and add white lines to encapsulate some of these shapes. So my work looks both real and unreal. And as uh, Tess has mentioned and other people also, it has a stained glass quality, I suppose, because of the lines which I add for uh, emphasis and, and I feel they give energy and structure as well to these paintings. My painting, Shifting Sands, is of a is an actual place, which I usually paint from, places that I've actually visited. Um, it's, in North, it's a place called North Beach in Florida, which has a large grove of trees on the right as you enter the beach. And um, as you walk towards the Gulf, uh, there's big pools of water and uh, they're, they're, they're not just, you know, little puddles. Uh, they, they're like ankle deep you have to walk through. And um, I always found that amazing because it was the only beach I've ever been on where you've seen all that um, water before you actually see the Gulf or the whatever ocean you're, you're looking at. So um, that gave me the idea of beach erosion and how water, you know, getting onto the beach like that will eventually maybe, you know, erode the, the beach itself and, um, and perhaps loss of habitat for, you know, creatures such as birds, which might need the area uh, for stopovers. Um, I inserted the, uh, the, the bird, uh, because um, it, I felt it related to the theme, of course, and uh, I wanted to make it part of and parcel of that landscape. It's um, um, blending in with the clouds and, and showing a kind of determination, but also fragility uh, in its uh, lonely, um, 
migration. These beautiful creatures actually go thousands of miles um, from one area to another when they migrate and um, need places to stop and to restore their energy and to uh, feed and so on. Uh, and we need to be aware and try to preserve those stopovers as well as the areas where they finally do end up. Um, so I find that uh, it gave me an, the idea of migration and then the beach erosion was the idea of preservation of uh, land was the second part of the idea that made me do this painting. That's perfect, Gloria. Thank you so much. Um, I, I've been in the gallery with visitors and uh, people always ask questions about your work in general. And we're, people stood there and in the drawer did this as well, stood there for a while looking at it. And then the bird comes into view. Your eye is drawn into the forest and then up to the left of the painting. And that bird surprises everyone and delights everyone that sees it. So thank you for talking about that. Thank so you. I want to thank all of our artists for uh, their creative and technical uh, sharing uh, with us. That was really good. Um, this, do we have slides after this, I hope? Is this the last one? Okay, we're missing some slides. So I will oh, just... Yeah. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> we're missing a couple of slides. We have a few things coming up. Uh, do we want to look for them? And I'll just uh, yeah, the talk. Are we could be before right after Gloria's uh, painting? No, they're not. I don't yeah. think so. I think maybe it's the wrong. Um, oh, it's the you. wrong bunch of slides. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, if you guys want to look for them, I'll, I'll just talk. And if yeah, you can find them, that's it. and then I'll let you share your screen. <laughs> all right uh okay. all right i'll i'll just talk a little bit about um uh things hey <laughs> there i am um okay uh i wanted to talk a little bit about um something that linda mentioned which is our fifth annual art installation going going gone um it's in the lobby of the uh, johnson education center it is uh, complementary to the jury show. It's not part of the jury uh, exhibit. Uh, we've been doing this for five years now and uh, people, the artists love it and uh, people love it. And that I think we're going to the right place. Yep. Yeah, up one more, a couple more. Uh, yeah, that's one. the first one. Is that the first one? Okay, mm -hmm. so. Um, it is in the lobby. Every time you look at this, people come in and look at it. Um, they you find something new. It's it's wonderful. Uh, going going gone. Um, for this, we had fifty three Garden State watercolor artists submitted one hundred and twenty three paintings of animals using a designated color scheme for air at the top, land in the middle, and water at the bottom. And here we are uh, putting it together. Uh, Joan Capaldo and her daughter Juliet, myself, Judy Hummer, and Joanne Amantia taking the pictures. We're installing this using recycled and reused materials. And uh, so that, that's always fun to figure out how to do this. Uh, the artists had to choose. Let's see, go to the next slide, please. Okay, there it, there it is in all its glory. Um, so artists had to paint from a list of 107 species that have been identified by New Jersey DEP as species in greatest need of our conservation efforts. So the beauty of our art installation is that when it's hung together, the small five by seven paintings tell a, quite a big story uh, of what our uh, species are dealing with and look beautiful. I highly recommend um, people coming in to see it. Everything is affordable. Uh, all of the paintings from here and the jury exhibition are for sale, and a portion of the proceeds goes to the DNR Greenway 
to further their, uh, their important mission. So the next three slides or three, the next slide is the three paintings that uh, Linda mentioned. We have three paintings. Um, one of them uh, is owned by someone that is on the call right now. Hi, Carrie, how you doing? <laughs> and um, so this in honor of, I uh, th thought we'd show you uh, these three in honor of um, the science talk that we just had. Okay, so the next one is just a little bit about what's left uh, to, to happen. We're we're very happy to have a nice long run for this show. It gives people a lot of opportunity to go see it. We've had a lot of uh, events and will continue to. I mentioned the first uh, poetry workshop uh, that we attended and it was way more fun than you might think. It was just very exciting. <laughs> um, so there will be two more, one in July and one in August. And the people that were leading those uh, workshops, uh, if you want to, uh, participants in the workshop get to submit their poems to, uh, to them, and they will choose approximately 10 uh, to be read at a poetry public poetry reading on Thursday, September 21st. And we will pair that with some sort of gallery walk um, talking about the art that's uh, that's in the uh, in the galleries, um, the poetry is, they're all based on uh, a painting, one of the paintings that is in the George Show. Um, so that's that's really going to be fun. And I was so surprised at what people could come up with uh, and and how they responded emotionally to the paintings in the jewelry show. On the last day, we will have a live artist demonstration by Anne Green, uh, who is one of, uh, one of our award-winning artists. And she does a lovely mix, uh, interesting mix of abstract and um, creative painting. And then the exhibition will close on the 24th. So that is it. So we have a, a, a little more time if anybody has questions for the artists or Linda Mead or Leah, more about bats. So I want to thank you for joining us and uh, we have a few more minutes for questions. So Tess, this is Linda. And while people are typing their questions in the chat, um, let me just thank you for your leadership. You know, watching this and listening to the artists made me think about how far we've come in our partnership. Uh, DNR Greenway, since our very beginning, has always had an affinity for working with artists. And as Tess has brought her environmental science background from her profession and her talent as an artist, along with the other leadership of the Garden State Watercolor Society, we've really expanded our ability to teach people and create awareness about the conservation that is so important in our communities. Um, we have also partnered with Conserve Wildlife Foundation, this being, I think, overall over the last couple of years, at least our third uh, Zoom with Conserve Wildlife Foundation talking about conservation of wildlife in New Jersey. So bringing these things together, I think, does exactly what DNR Greenway hopes to do in our galleries, which is to inspire people to care and to help us protect the wildlife that's found in New Jersey and on our preserves. And I will say one of the other things I love about your exhibits is all the art sells. I mean, the, the, the paintings are selling and there's more, many more available, but you know, when they sell, it, it supports the artists and it supports DNR Greenway's work. So we're very grateful for that and you know, strongly encourage people to visit and just you know, peruse and enjoy the art. Um, it, in the summertime, most of the time, all the rooms are open. Um, if we're having a meeting, we've invited people to come on in and still look at the art. Um, or you can always call ahead of time and make sure things are open. But generally from 10 to 4, Monday to Friday, um, you can come in and, and peruse the art. I'll also mention that we just hung in the Children's Art Gallery, which is called our Olivia Rainbow Gallery. Um, a complimentary art exhibit by Conserve Wildlife Foundation called Species on the Edge. 
And this is a contest that, that Conserve Wildlife runs every year with fifth graders. And fifth grade students create a piece of art and an essay to go along with it that is all about a species of endangered wildlife in the state of New Jersey. And there's a winner from every, every county in New Jersey. So those are right now very complimentary, hanging in the Children's Art Gallery at DNR Greenway. And we encourage you to see these young artists, fifth graders, some of which you take a look at and, and you can't believe they're fifth graders. So they're, I think, future members of the Garden State Watercolor Society. So with that, I'll turn it back to you to see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, right now, there's no, no, no questions right now in the chat. Everybody had a good time. I think that's what they're saying. But uh, I, I just want to say that that's exactly right, Linda. I know this, uh, these collaborations, and and now including the poets, it's it's so exciting, and uh, we're so glad that we're able to do it. And um, we love when paintings sell too. Some people ask, "Oh, are you sad to see so and so painting go?" I'm like, "No, we want to. We would. We love that somebody else loves it enough to take it home, and uh, and and to be appreciated enough for someone to buy our art. It, it's true. So let's thank Leah again and Linda and our artists, and thanks for joining us. This a video of this. Um, happy hour will be available uh, on our website, which is gswcs.org, and it'll be under resources, uh, tutorials, I think. So uh, thanks for coming and participating, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the galleries. Thank you, everyone. Good night.